Sonic the Hedgehog, everybody's favourite blue hedgehog, of which there are many to choose from. There's Sonic. Um. Uh. Well, technically speaking, we should refer to him as Sonny, at least until we're friends and then nicknames are fine, but until then it's just a little rude. Or even Project Ogle v Morris Hedgehog Jr, if you read the Archie comics. Either way, whether it's Sonic the Child, Sonic the Teenager, or Sonic the Hipster Millennial, there are countless iterations of his games, some of which are fantastic, some are not that fantastic. But this video is focusing on the blue spiky one's adventures in handheld gaming, or at least up until the early 2000s anyway, because over the years, despite making a name for himself in the console world, he's also brought thousands of hours of intense handheld pleasure to people all over the world. Almost as many as Christy Mack. You know who I mean. You know. And we start, appropriately enough, with Sonic the Hedgehog on Sega's flagship handheld system, the Game Gear, after all, I have it on good authority that the Game Gear separates the men from the boys. Hmm? You, you, you see what they did there? The men from, from, from the boys? The, the, the game boys? Hmm? Yeah, Nintendo still won. But no matter, because the Game Gear was actually a great system, and still is a great system. Look, even four-time Formula One world champion Alan Pross pretended to like it. And like the Game Boy, you knew when you bought it that you were getting a trusty companion for life. Um, it, it doesn't work anymore. It... Yeah, no, yeah, it's f Basically the same game as the Master System version, this isn't quite up to the standards of the Mega Drive game. But in many ways I actually like it more. The platforming seems more genuine, as there isn't as much of a focus on simply going fast and watching the backgrounds fly past you. I actually really like the 8-bit versions. Sega did the right thing creating specific games for the systems, rather than just jamming a watered-down version of the 16-bit game into a small cartridge. They actually did it really well. So well, in fact, that even Janet Jackson sampled the music. I suppose Sonic was styled on her brother Michael, so I guess that's fitting. Sonic 2 suffered a little bit from trying too hard to cram 16-bit features into an 8-bit game, but overall you still feel that these are relics of the long-lost days when everything Sonic touched turned to gold. As well as the main series of games, the Game Gear got a slew of spin-offs including Sonic Blast, Sonic Spinball, Sonic Chaos, which by the way is fantastic, and Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, which is also pretty good, but it's just Puyo Puyo by another name, so of course it's good. It also received its own exclusives, such as Sonic Drift 1 and 2, Tails Adventure, Sonic Labyrinth, which by the way is anything but fantastic, and Sonic Triple Trouble. Sadly, despite its strengths and the fact that it sold over 10 million units, the Game Gear died in 1996. But one company's loss is another one's gain, and no, in this instance I'm not referring to Nintendo. Things were going just swimmingly for a company making licensed handheld games that relied simply on LCD images appearing on a fixed background. Tiger handhelds were immensely popular, for some reason, and they had their very own Sonic games. I have one here. In fact, in the same year, albeit a few months apart, Sonic the Hedgehog debuted on the Mega Drive slash Genesis, the Master System, the Game Gear, and Tiger LCDs. And there were loads of these things. There's Sonic 2, Sonic 3, Sonic Pinball, Sonic 3D Blast, even Sonic the Wrist Game, which was based on the, the NES version, which is a good one. They were on TV, they were in magazines, thanks to Tiger's marketing machine. Or was it Grand Slam's marketing machine? Or Grand Stand? Grunid Stand. Clearly fact-checking wasn't so important for journalists in the 90s, but then, to be fair, there was a lot of ecstasy and acid floating about, so I guess that's to be expected. The idea behind these games was to create a simple, casual version of a certain stage or element in each game. For example, I think this is meant to be Emerald Hill Zone from the Mega Drive version of Sonic 2. I don't... I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. What, what do I have to do? A game this basic shouldn't need instructions. There's... 
a score up here. Is, is that good? H how am I doing that? I, I don't know what I'm doing! Whilst Tiger cracked on with their LCD games... Ew. Sega decided to try something, well, to borrow a suitably 90s word, radical. Now, the Game Gear played essentially Master System games, of sorts. Some were ported from the Game Gear, some to it. And while that was impressive for the time, it basically cemented the Game Gear in the middle of the market. Game Boy was affordable and fun despite the crudeness of the graphics. The Turbo Express was a technological masterpiece allowing inter-console play, but at the expense of... well, the expense. And the Game Gear was just torn between the two of them. This would be rectified, however, with Sega's final attempt at a handheld console, the Nomad, which, for illustrative purposes, I'm not holding up because I don't have one. This actually started off as a semi-handheld. The Nomad was born from the Sega Mega Jet. This wasn't a handheld in the stricter sense because it didn't have its own screen, but it was a combined console and controller that was made available on board Japan Airlines flights. There was also a retail version released, but it still lacked a screen and couldn't be powered without an AC adapter. On Japan Airlines flights, technically speaking, passengers could bring their own cartridges, as many Japanese Mega Drive games would work with the system, but only four were made available to rent on the plane, one of which being... Sonic the Hedgehog. The Mega Jet eventually became the basis for the Nomad, and much like the Turbo Express, the Nomad had no library of its own. It didn't need one. This was a console that could play all of your favourite console games on the go, and not Master System games, oh no, Mega Drive games or actually Genesis, to be more accurate, as it was US only. In fact, you could even plug it into the TV and play it as a Genesis. So, in the absence of a Nomad, I guess let's play Sonic the Hedgehog on... well, the Genesis. not bad for a handheld. Either way, the Nomad went on to be one of the worst-selling handheld consoles of all time. It never even got a UK release, or even a European release for that matter. In fact, Japan never got their hands on it. It's a shame, really, considering this was a proper 16-bit, full-colour, backlit handheld, when Nintendo hadn't even released the Game Boy Color yet. With no more handhelds in the pipeline, Sega had to look elsewhere, opting to produce software for other handheld systems rather than their own. Seeing as they'd had reasonable success with Tiger and their cheap LCD standalones earlier in the decade, they were intrigued by their new project to produce the first proper touchscreen gaming system. Oh dear. Are we, are we actually going here? Are we actually doing this? Do, we, do I actually have to play this thing? Uh. Oh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm taking a break though, I, but I'm not doing that without taking a break. I'll be back, maybe.